think the one film that really hit me hard that came out of those formative years of me being a cinephile was The Crow. I was in high school. I was a big fan of the James O'Barr comic book. I remember traveling to New York to meet the man and have my graphic novel signed. I first came across the comic, The Crow, when it was a very small printing of its first edition and immediately was engrossed in the story of this first issue. Its plot is about a guy who is killed too soon and he comes back and he exacts vengeance. It's just about a guy who was in love with a woman and you know, she gets killed and you come back from the dead and you, know, you avenge her death. And as a high schooler, that, uh, it was just angsty enough to connect with me. The crow is kind of the hand of God that allows that person who's been taken to heaven to return to put something horrible right. Within that lies a beautiful underlying story of love and the conviction that if a loved one is harmed, there is an opportunity to extract justice for those who have lost people dear to them through tragic circumstances. So that began my odyssey to option material, develop it, and turn it into a feature film. We started filming on February 1st, 1993 in Wilmington, North Carolina. Everyone was invested a thousand percent in trying to make, you know, a film that would stand shoulder to shoulder with any studio release on a fraction of the budget. I think there's plenty of material if you want to find a curse in the making of the movie The Crow. When they set up pre-production offices, they had a voicemail message that said, don't make this movie, bad things will happen. On the very first day, uh, principal photography, two of our electricians had a very uh, un, uh, a terrible accident. Everything's ready to go. Remember, they only shot at night, so night had fallen. They were driving their uh, pickup truck with a cherry picker. He backed his cherry picker up into a live wire. He caught on fire. It ended up hitting the high tension wire, uh, high electric wire that uh, would uh, carry, carry the voltage to run all the lights and the back lot set. He was rushed to the hospital. He had second and third degree burns all over his body. He didn't die. He lost his ears, but it was a terrible tragedy. And then they had to start shooting. We went through the storm of the century. The hurricane is now at its peak, with winds reaching speeds of more than 115 miles an hour. That was a, a terrible hurricane that destroyed our back lot set. Word had gotten back to people in Hollywood, and there was an article from Entertainment Weekly that called what was going on in our location, The Curse of the Crow. One of the staff in the production office decided to make an ill-timed comment that things have happened, but she said, uh, it's, it's not like anyone has died. When I had learned that they were making a crow, I followed that like crazy, you know? I read Fangoria, I read Entertainment Weekly, I was following everything that was going on um, with Brandon Lee. What we needed for the role was someone who was a true athlete and a great actor. We'd gotten an opportunity to see Rapid Fire. We were absolutely sold. The only person we made an offer to was Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee was trying to make a name for himself. Uh, was trying to kind of come out from the shadow of his father and was making films which, in the realm of action films, weren't so bad. Rapid Fire, Showdown in Little Tokyo. He, like his father, had so much potential. You're seeing his star rise, and then he got robbed, just like his father did. I'm Lance Anderson, and I worked on The Crow as a special makeup effects artist. My job was to take care of Brandon, to do all of his makeup throughout the film. This is the original script that I've kept. It has a lot of my original continuity shots. This is establishing makeup. 
As it progresses, the makeup starts to get more worn. And this is when he falls out the window. It's kind of strange looking at those photos. Yeah. We hired the immensely talented actor Michael Berryman to play the role of the Skull Cowboy, which was a character that appears intermittently in James O'Barr's comic, The Crow. Well, I got a call from my agent and went to a meeting. And the next thing I knew, I was flying to um, North Carolina, to Wilmington. I spent hours and hours and hours getting a full body cast and head cast. We made this suit for Michael Berryman, and it had uh, a complete bodysuit sculpture for the whole ribs and the whole thing. He basically wore a giant suit and articulated fingers. It was very difficult to wear. And then on my head, I had a, a mandible jaw that was acrylic, and it was bolted front to back with a top piece that had these little servo transmitters and these little paddles would move the flesh underneath the latex. It was pretty extensive makeup. I've been asked where did the Skull Cowboy originate from? And it obviously came out of the creativity of James Abar. James wrote because it was part of his therapy. His fiance was killed by a drunk, drunk driver. And in order to remain here on this earth, in this physical plane, he had to come to grips with it. And so he wrote. Sometimes in life, you can take from what you have experienced and bring a piece of that into the character that you're developing. And it can help you heal. It can help you have a cathartic experience, and it enhances the performance. There had been lots of press material touching on the curse nature of the film, that perhaps it was a continuation of the curse of Bruce Lee, who died under mysterious circumstances while shooting a film. Pretty much everyone's discovered Bruce Lee after he passed away. Then you start doing research on who he was, and then as you look into how he passed away, that's when the theories start. There's theories that there was a hit on him from the Chinese mafia for betraying martial arts secrets. One of the interesting fantasy theories is that Bruce Lee was struck by a death blow. And a death blow is a, a specific type of strike. <laughs> which its impact doesn't take effect until days, weeks, months, years later. There's one theory that Bruce Lee's passing was part of the Lee family curse. Bruce Lee's parents lost their first male son. This was attributed to a belief that there was a curse or a demon after the males in the Lee family. You had an older brother, you see. He died in childbirth. The demon took him away from us. The firstborn man child is very valuable. He was sometimes uh, dressed in girls' clothing, sometimes referred to by a female name, again, in order to deflect and break the curse on the males of the family. We dress you in dresses so the demon wouldn't know I had another son. But now he knows. And he's coming for you. In Dragon the Bruce Lee story, Bruce Lee is portrayed as being haunted by a demon, this kind of dark figure in kind of samurai armor, and there's a scene where he's trying to protect his son in these kind of dreamlike pursuits. The actual circumstances around Bruce Lee's death are much more banal. Yes, he was found dead at the apartment of a young starlet who he may or may not have been having an affair with. 
while at this apartment, uh, he took a painkiller. He went for a nap and didn't wake up. They attributed his death to having a hypersensitivity to this particular painkiller. Recently, there's been a biography published, Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Pauly, and he puts this theory forward that it was a heat stroke which killed Bruce Lee. Leading up to uh, in the last year of his death, he had his sweat glands removed because he wanted to look good on screen. A month or so before the day that he passed away, he actually had a seizure and a stroke. And so this potentially could just be the reverberations of the previous misdiagnosed heat stroke. Game of Death is Bruce Lee's final film. He doesn't live to finish it. And that's already a weird parallel with what happens to Brandon Lee and the Crow. You ready for the reverse angle? It gets even weirder when you consider that Bruce Lee's character is shot on the set of a film in Game of Death, which is exactly how his son dies in 1993. Gentlemen, these are blanks. Only aim upward. There's a wad of paper that comes out and can injure someone. Okay, roll the sound. Action! It was the night of March 30th, 1993. We were a day 47 out of what then grown to 52 days uh, and nearing the end of production. In the scene, Eric Draben has just returned and the villains are already in the home and have been treating Sophia Sheenis' character, Shelley, very violently. I was down in the trailer getting a rig that I had rigged for Brandon to wear, where uh, a knife is thrown at him when he comes through the door. And uh, I built a harness. They would throw the knife, and then the knife would be embedded in his chest. So I was down there getting that ready, and they told me they need me on set. And the director said, we're changing that scene. He's going to come through the door, and he's going to get shot. Eric puts himself between these villains and Shelley, and Michael Massey as fun boy, takes a gun and fires at uh, the character of Eric Draven. The camera was in the wrong position when he came through the door, and it didn't look like he was aiming the gun at Brandon. So they either moved the actor or they moved the camera or something to get a better angle so it looked more realistic that he's being shot. When he came through the door with the grocery bag, they do the shot, and then he drops down, and everybody waits for him to get up, and he didn't get up. He just stayed there. He just didn't move, and somebody says, I, I think he's really hurt. And uh, <clears throat> call a medic, call a medic. The medic came and uh, he's been shot. And I just, I felt all the blood rush, rush out of my body. And I just dropped down and everybody was around me, was doing the same thing. They were just shocked. Did you go to the hospital? Yes. Um, I I don't want to talk about going to the hospital. Can we? Can we? Um, we went to the hospital, and we waited around for hours, and then they came out and told us that he passed on. It was one of the most horrible things in my life to see that happen and be there. Michael Massey was 
I mean, to put it mildly beside himself, he was broken by the experience of um, having pulled the trigger. Uh, I don't think he could have taken on any greater responsibility on his own shoulders, although it was not by any means his fault. Plain and simple, and it wasn't his job to be responsible for that particular weapon. Chinese Mafia executed Bruce Lee and then his son. I mean, that's where things were going, you know, with the tabloids. Uh, blood on the set. Um, what really happened? How could a bullet end up in a gun? That, well, it wasn't a bullet. It was a, a dummy head. The dummy head was, was still in the chamber. And it blew it out. What occurred was that there was a dummy bullet loaded two weeks before that had lodged a real bullet in the barrel of the gun. These are different caliber dummy rounds that we have. And the whole goal to making dummy rounds is to make an imitation round that would lead the viewer to believe that it is a live round. So this is the dummy round and this is the live round. Even though this is a dummy round and it's had the gunpowder removed, uh, the primer hasn't been removed or struck. When we do a dummy round, it's always important to remove the primer cap from the center. What happened on the crow was when they put the dummy round in, they forgot to remove the primer. And what happens is, again, that primer has enough force to dislodge the lead round and actually push it into the barrel. We're actually gonna pull the trigger and it'll have just enough force to lodge the, the round in there. So you can see in there our dummy round. We'll index it. Three, two, one. So just with that simple action, that little snap, the, the cap's gone off, no gunpowder, but what we'll be able to prove is the hung round inside the barrel. Inside that barrel, we have the obstruction. But if you look down the barrel, you'll notice that there's no light coming through. So that would tell me that there's an obstruction. In this case, a lead round a hollow point. That's the one thing they didn't do. They didn't check the barrel for an obstruction. The problem with that is when you put a blank in there, then after whatever's in there, be it rock, dirt, or a hung round, that round comes out flying at three to 5,000 PSI. So when we're ready, I'll put a round in here. It's gonna be a, uh, a blank, a half load blank. This is it, there's no lead projectile. It's just crimped at the end, but it's got powder. The crimp's hot, but this produces enough powder to push this lead round into that board through two inches of plywood. So when we're ready, three, two, one. The round's gone off. I can go check down range. We can actually see the round that punctured through it. Right here. That's your round. That was the hung round that got pushed into the barrel with uh, with just the primer cap. And what you can see is, I don't know if you can see the striations, but it actually fired the round. So this would definitely be a lethal round. This would be something you don't get up from. After this tremendous tragedy unfolded, we as filmmakers, um, our initial response was that um, we, we, we couldn't film uh, any further without Brandon, even though we were at the end of um, our our schedule uh, and it, it was be, because we just couldn't even fathom moving forward at that time we heard from Brandon's fiance Eliza Hutton who, who's to be married to a short time after we completed photography and his mother Linda Lee that Brandon was incredibly proud of the work that he had performed and they said, you know, if, if you are up to it, we want you all to finish this. I didn't want to come back, but I kept thinking about, this is Brandon's film. This is a film that he wanted to be a launching pad for him. And if I didn't go back and do what I could do to make sure this film gets seen, whatever I can do, uh, I'll do it because if this film wasn't seen, wasn't finished, it'd be a shame. 
But they called me up and they said, they want to use a double. And Brandon's stunt double looked a lot like him. And they wanted me to make a mask on the stunt double of Brandon's face so they could use it in the film. That was really tough. That was really tough. To be honest, when the stunt double wore that thing, it freaked everybody out. I mean, literally freaked them out. When the feeling that you get when you're finishing a film with an actor who's passed on, it's not a good feeling. It's a very morbid feeling. And it's, it's something you deal with personally. You know, you don't feel good about it, but it, it just needed to be done. That's all, it just needed to be done. There were changes that they had to make. Instead of doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one dialogues, uh, scenes between Eric Draven, for example, and his girlfriend, they had to do a lot in montage. A lot was done in shadow. They had to take out one character, uh, the Skull Cowboy. They had shot just one setup shot of him with Brandon Lee, and that was in the beginning of production. They were gonna fly him back at the end. They never ended up doing that. They, they had to write around the convention of that character. When I got the word of what had happened, I had so many mixed emotions. The number one sense of loss was being cheated because Brandon was engaged, number one, for him and Eliza. Number two, this wonderful young man that I'd been introduced to just snatched away like that. And then people are going, the, the curse of the crow, you know, Carloco Studios, there was an, some, an electrician, somebody got electrocuted. This happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. Don't you think, is it possible? Is it, uh, really? Really? No. The crow was not cursed. The crow was created out of love and loss. In my opinion, Brandon died because a studio cut corners. They sent home the weapons expert that we had. It's a right to work state in a union busting environment. And after so many weeks, it is my understanding that contractually they could hire a local person to do all of the uh, armaments and weapons. That is my personal opinion. Someone was overworked, and you miss one little oops, and something happens. Makes you appreciate every day, and then you should appreciate every hour, and pretty soon every moment. I'm at most calm when I can appreciate each breath, and especially appreciative when I hear that beautiful note of a heartbeat, life is very precious. It's hard with The Crow to separate fiction and reality. I think that people will continue to find curses with The Crow. They're, they're gonna continue to find some new element to relate back to something that maybe happened to Bruce Lee or some of the other actors on the film, like if something tragic happens to one of them. And I think people want to cling to those sort of curse legends. They want to have a story that kind of justifies something so tragic. From that is born just a fascination with trying to look at this through the lens of possible conspiracy that could have netted this tremendous loss and this horrible accident. Truly, I sympathize but the sideshow of looking for conspiracies within that loss, I think, take away from what he did. I do believe that there's a great film there and, and it stands on its own merits. And I'm proud of the film. One can look to a number of films that followed in its wake in terms of look and feel and design. 
It really did launch a different approach to the futuristic films and comic book adaptations because it really is a very unique piece of art and filmmaking with a central performance by Brandon Lee that is really, truly incredible. It was bittersweet for me, personally. The vengeful spirit of Eric Draven, the vengeful spirit of the Skull Cowboy, my dear friend Brandon. You can't be prepared for these moments, but you can carry on in honor of those that have left us. <laughs>